The Civil War is one of the darkest chapters in American history. As the nation was divided between North and South and locked into a conflict that would cost the lives of 620,000 Americans. Today, on Record West Virginia, we explore an event that some historians would call the Civil War's dress rehearsal. John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry. John Brown's father, Owen Brown, vehemently opposed slavery, and in 1805, he moved the Brown family to Hudson, Ohio, a district of Ohio that was staunchly anti-slavery. These views on the institution of slavery were passed on to his son. In 1825, the younger Brown moved to New Richmond, Pennsylvania, and started a tannery. Here, Brown began to actively participate as an abolitionist, and his tannery became a major stop on the Underground Railroad. But after the assassination of fellow abolitionist Elijah P. Lovejoy, Brown became disillusioned with the pacifist approach to abolishing slavery. In the mid-1850s, while living on a farm in New York, where he was helping free blacks establish a community, he received word from his sons out west about militant pro-slavers by 1856, Brown was a leader in a series of violent confrontations over the legality of slavery in the proposed state of Kansas. These border wars resulted in several casualties and became known widely as Bleeding Kansas. John Brown's entire family, from his father to uh, himself to his sons, uh, lived their entire lives dedicated to the cause of anti-slavery at a time when very few white people uh, even acknowledged it as a problem. He was consistently devoted to, to anti-slavery. 1850 is one of the major turning points with the, with the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act, where Brown realizes that something more is going to be needed. And I think the greatest turning point in his life is 1855, when his sons uh, inform him of what is happening in Kansas, where free soiler settlers, people who oppose the spread of slavery, if not slavery itself, have been trying to create a new life uh, in, in the territory of Kansas and were under constant threat of attack by pro-slavery men coming in from Missouri. John Brown personally moves to Kansas with his family. He and his sons and his family dedicate themselves to the cause of protecting the free soilers. So this is the climate. Ostensibly it's pro-slavery versus anti-slavery, but it's as much a question of political and economic control of the territory. This is the environment John Brown enters. John Brown doesn't see it that way, though. He sees this as a biblical struggle between good and evil. Now back east, Brown began to formulate a plot to create a new state for freed slaves and believed that once the first battle began in his fight to create a sanctuary for free black men and women, that slaves across the South would rise up and carry out a rebellion under his command. Harper's Ferry became Brown's target to start this uprising, based on the town being the location of a federal armory and its proximity to the South. Brown had strong allies in the abolitionist movement, like Harriet Tubman, but many others, such as Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison, had reservations about Brown and his tactics fearing he was on a suicide mission. John Brown meets with Harriet Tubman more than once, John Brown meets with Frederick Douglass. He shares his plan and his vision for creating, uh, you could almost call it a free state in Appalachia. The reason it's difficult to know exactly what happened in these meetings is that Frederick Douglass has to distance himself from John Brown after the raid. He publishes uh, an article where he talks about uh, how he had warned John Brown that uh, Harper's Ferry was a steel trap. Some of John Brown's descendants claim that Frederick Douglass uh, was more supportive of the plan than, than, than Douglass will later claim to be. Uh, but again, it's important to recognize uh, that after John Brown's raid, 
people like Frederick Douglass were in a lot of, uh, a lot of danger because of, of any association. However, I take Douglass at his word that Douglas warned John Brown that his plan was foolhardy. John Brown goes to Canada and meets with black leaders there who had escaped from slavery and, and, and established their own black republic, much uh, like what John Brown hoped to create in Appalachia. And they exhort John Brown to reconsider his plan and to support what they're doing. One of the lasting lessons of John Brown's failure uh, is his failure to recognize that black leaders were doing the work he hoped to do and to support and join them rather than leading a separate fight. Had John Brown done that, we can only imagine how successful he might have been because John Brown personally leads a dozen slaves to freedom uh, on this perilous, amazing journey of 1,500 miles. Instead of following that, instead of following the model of the Underground Railroad that had been pioneered by African Americans and other white abolitionists, he becomes convinced that he needs to take the war, in his words, to Africa, by which he meant the South. He was convinced that something more needed to be done than what he saw as these piecemeal attacks on slavery. As the sun fell on the Shenandoah Valley on October 16, 1859, Brown and his band of raiders made their way into the town of Harper's Ferry from nearby Maryland. Brown sent a small detachment, led by John Cook, to capture Colonel Lewis Washington, a great-grandnephew of George Washington, and to free the slaves on Washington's Bel Air estate. Brown and the rest of his party continued to make their way toward the armory, but first needed to ensure that word of their attack could not be sent to Washington, D.C. They cut the wire to the telegraph line and even seized the train as it passed through en route to the nation's capital. For some unknown reason, Brown allowed the train to continue on its journey and the conductor warned officials of the raiders' presence upon arriving in D.C. Shortly after, Hayward Shepard would become the first casualty of Brown's raid. He was shot in the back when he refused to freeze and tried to run back into the station. Shepard was a free black man. The early casualties at Harper's Ferry are African Americans. John Brown's men uh, come across a black porter who, uh, of course, wouldn't have known the context. Uh, he just sees armed men and, and does uh, what, what, what any brave man would do. He tries to confront them, and in that moment, he is shot and killed. His name was Hayward Shepard. Another African American is killed at Harper's Ferry, Dangerfield Newby. Dangerfield Newby uh, was in his 40s. Uh, he, had been a, he had been a slave uh, who had uh, become emancipated, and he had made it his mission to free his wife and his children. So he moves in search of work, and he ends up being one of the few African Americans that joins uh, with John Brown's force. He is also the first of John Brown's raiders to be killed. When they find Newby's body, on his body is a letter from his wife expressing her fears that she's about to be sold to another owner and that she will be lost to him forever. Now it's impossible to know exactly what his motivation is, but many historians connect the hopelessness he must have felt with his willingness to join John Brown's army and to give his life, perhaps, uh, to strike a blow at slavery. By the early morning hours of October 17th, Brown and his men had successfully managed to take the armory at Harper's Ferry. But fighting with both local militias and townspeople was escalating. After realizing their escape route had been cut off, the raiders had now moved into a smaller fire engine house across from the armory, hoping that it would be easier to defend. Casualties were quickly piling up on both sides as the mayor of Harper's Ferry and Brown's son Watson were both fatally shot. At this point, President James Buchanan ordered that a group of Marines under the command of Colonel Robert E. Lee be sent to finally end the insurrection. On the morning of October 18th, Lee's Marines attacked and in three minutes had overtook Brown's forces and captured Brown himself who had no choice but to surrender. The raid was over, 
but not before 17 men lay dead. So John Brown's raid is a fascinating and short-lived event in American history. It's effectively over almost as soon as it starts. It's hard for us to wrap our head around the initial success of John Brown's raid. This idea that 19 moderately armed men could take over a federal arsenal uh, is hard for us to really wrap our heads around. It was easy for a small uh, force to surprise and overwhelm the guards. Um, the problem was that Frederick Douglass's warning to John Brown was incredibly prescient, that Harper's Ferry was a steel trap. Because as soon as word spreads about John Brown's raid, it spreads like wildfire. And there are rumors that there are 100, 200, 400 men. And these white militias immediately arm themselves and surround the town, which, make, which makes it impossible for John Brown to do the two things he needed to do. One would be to spread awareness of the raid among area African-Americans and others who might, uh, might perhaps join uh, with him. And two, it became impossible for him to move. And so he and his supporters, his defenders, his small army became trapped. Uh, they are surrounded by white militias and eventually the United States Marines come in. And the event is, is over really before it has a chance to begin. And so in order to keep the raid a, a secret, he couldn't create the groundswell of support that he would have needed. And of course, without that groundswell of support, he becomes completely surrounded, isolated, and has no choice but to eventually surrender while surrounded by the corpses of his own supporters. John Brown was executed for treason on December 2nd of 1859. On that morning he wrote, I am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged by anything but blood. In less than two years, the Civil War began. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Record West Virginia, and if you did, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.